Hello, everyone, and welcome to MSK Unknown Case Series Week 30. Today, we have a coronal and a sagittal CT images of the lower leg. We're looking specifically at the tibia, and there is an obvious abnormality along the tibia here, which we can see on the, both the coronal and sagittal images. And the question that I have for you guys is, what's the most likely diagnosis in this 25-year-old male? Is it Erdheim Chester disease, Camerati Engelman disease, acute osteomyelitis, or osteopetrosis? What's the most likely diagnosis? And remember, this is a pretty young 25-year-old male. Well, this, of course, is a case of Camerati Engelman disease. We have kind of diffuse cortical thickening along the diaphysis of a long bone. It kind of extends to the metaphysis, but not really. It spares the epiphysis. There's a little of intramedullary sclerosis as well. A really nice look for Camerati Engelman disease or uh, progressive diaphyseal dysplasia, which is what it's usually called. This occurs in very young individuals. So typically patients are less than 30 years old when they are diagnosed with Camerati Engelman disease. Typically this presents with diaphyseal cortical thickening. It may extend to the metaphysis, but it'll never extend to the epiphysis. If you see this in the epiphysis, it's not a case of Camerati Engelman disease. Now, often you can get some intramedullary sclerosis as we saw in this case, but that's not the dominant feature. The dominant feature is really endosteal and periosteal uh, cortical thickening that we see in a long bow. Typically it's symmetric, so it will often be bilateral. Uh, and this is typically what we see in Camerati Engelman disease. I wanna go over the differential diagnosis because and talk about why the other choices were not the best choice in this case. So Camerati Engelman, typically the cortical thickening is what predominates. We did have intramedullary sclerosis, but it was really the cortical thickening that was the most pronounced aspect of this case. And again, this happens in a younger patient population, which is also very important. That's why I gave the history of a 25-year-old that presented with this. In Erdogan Chester, it can look very similar because you do get patchy sclerosis involving you know, long bones. It's also symmetric. Uh, it can involve cortical thickening as well as medullary sclerosis, but the medullary sclerosis is really the dominant feature. The cortical thickening along the endosteum and periosteum happens often later in the disease process. And the other important feature is that this presents typically in older individuals. So often patients that are in their 50s or 60s, even up to their 70s, present with Erdheim Chester disease. It's more of a systemic disease where you get lipid-laden histiocytes and infiltrate not only the bones, but also the viscera. So you may have uh, cardiovascular, uh, and even renal abnormalities associated with Erdheim Chester disease. Acute osteomyelitis is really a case of focal cortical thickening, right? This is a case of diffuse cortical thickening that I showed in the index case, but acute osteomyelitis may result in focal cortical thickening. You may have signs of infection, fever, uh, you know, elevated ESR. You may have soft tissue swelling, a sinus tract, soft tissue gas that you see on imaging, right? So, you know, very different than what we saw in our case. And of course, osteopetrosis is a skeletal dysplasia, uh, it happens typically in the younger population, just like in our patient, but often the skull and the axial skeleton is more commonly involved. Now, you can definitely get skull involvement in Camerati Engelman disease, but, you know, typically you'll see involvement in the, in the spine in osteopetrosis, you know, the uh, diffuse sclerosis kind of within the entire vertebral body, uh, the bone in bone appearance, as people talk about with osteopetrosis, it can typically be uh, autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive. Camerati Engelman is actually usually auto, autosomal dominant with variable penetrance. So uh, typically the distribution is a bit different for osteopetrosis uh, versus Camerati Engelman. I think it's also helpful to talk about the differential for both focal cortical thickening of a long bone and diffuse cortical thickening of a long bone. If you remember to actually case one, case one when I showed a bisphosphonate fracture, that was a case of focal cortical thickening. And the differential for that, as I talked about, was a stress fracture or some sort of you know fracture, like you know a bisphosphonate fracture would be an example. Uh, you know, a fracture that's healing with callus, you know, that can result in focal cortical thickening. An osteodosteoma, which is a bone forming tumor that happens typically in young individuals with pain at night, relieved with aspirin, typically have a focus of cortical thickening along a long bone with central lucency and anitis with calcification. And of course, acute subacute osteomyelitis can result in focal cortical thickening of a long bone. But this was really a case of diffuse cortical thickening in a long bone. And the differential is much different, right? Typically, we think about you know, things like Paget's disease with you know, cortical thickening and coarsening of the trabeculae. Hypertrophic osteoarthropathy and venous stasis results in diffuse symmetric periostitis, which can simulate 
diffuse cortical thickening in the long bone. Of course, chronic osteomyelitis can result in diffuse cortical thickening, so not acute. In the acute phase, you expect focal cortical thickening, but in the chronic phase, you may see diffuse cortical thickening in the long bone. And of course, Camerati Engelman disease, as we saw in this case. So hopefully that was helpful in sort of piecing together, you know, cortical thickening, whether it's focal or diffuse. And I'll see you next week for another super high yield MSK unknown case. Thank you so much for your attention.